under number two. Uh, number three was about resource management contracts, which um, we have a model contract on the PCA website that uh, shows that a, a unified approach in working with a waste hauler on both uh, recycling and uh, garbage collection can bring down costs and sort of rationalize the process. We added into there to be much more clear. Resource management contracts, I think, are really think about them as a way to save money. Um, we wanted to put in ordinance licensing, sort of the sort of the uh, legal, sort of formal aspects of what cities can do, uh, whether they uh, uh, own garbage trucks, uh, do their own recycling, whether it's organized collection or not. So we have some ordinance licensing best management practices, uh, and I think, yeah, I'll show you a picture of those in a minute. Uh, yeah, and uh, because we worked with uh, uh, both a consulting group, long time consulting group, here um, in Minnesota to produce a, so basically a, a checklist for good, better, best licensing and ordinances that cities can um, work into their code. Number, so that's three. Number four uh, hasn't changed, uh, really looking up the hierarchy of uh, waste management. So reuse repair, rental businesses, promoting those, uh, making um, uh, residents, businesses wear those. Number five has not changed with added materials. Uh, working with Kayla Walsh here from the MPCA who will speak today, who's our, we're excited to you know, have our full-time person working on um, organics. So that hasn't really changed. Now, number six um, had commercial multifamily recycling and it had organized collection, sort of good, better, best ways that cities can again rationalize the process. And, at the very least, decreased truck road uh, um, wear and tear. We put organized collection in number seven, focused it there. There was a volume based sort of pay as you throw um, uh, materials there. So, number seven, uh, again, we left under number six, we left the city entries about organized collection and we just refer back and forth. So, if a person wants to look at all the cities that are claiming uh, what they've done under organized collection, you need to look under both. but. But we've just focused the organized um, collection actions under seven, that's new. And then under recycling, again, we've brought in this checklist, this both good, better, best, best management practices. Um, and again, added materials, which you'll hear about today on multifamily and business uh, recycling. And then number seven, uh, uh, construction, demolition, waste and recycling, no changes there. <coughs> so here's a little, you really can't see the, the table here, but you can maybe see the little, uh, boxes here, the check marks, and then the sort of, uh, sort of where to find out more information. So for the ordinance and, ordinance and licensing best practice, for the recycling best practice, and for the uh, organized collection best practice, we have a, uh, a checklist and it's organized along that good, better, best line that we have for Green Sub Cities. And this is really deep dive, sort of fine level detail um, for, uh, for waste management professionals. So in, in collecting organics, compostable materials, we obviously need to just with uh, collecting plastics and fibers and metals, we need to complete the loop. We need to uh, compost the material. We need to um, produce a mat uh, compostable um, a product that's <coughs> usable and purchased. So we have actions, um, uh, or we mentioned under these four actions, uh, specific ways using a, um, primarily a MnDOT specification for compost, sort of how cities can work with, you know, parks department, um, stormwater management people, um, urban forestry people, you know, depending on where your people are, who's doing purchasing, uh, or if you're doing centralized purchasing under action number 15, how you can specify how a, a city uh, can increase the use of compostables. <clears throat> Ideal, although we do not have uh, obviously, compostable facilities all over the state. Um, Kayla will talk about the ability for um, small sites to be set up. Um, actually, just just looking at the, uh, it, was, it was in Morris, yeah, the University of uh, Minnesota Morris has a small compostable site, which um, much easier to, I guess there's technically no light uh, permit required from the MPCA. So, um, so obviously, the closer one can collect create compost and then use it. And, and cities have a role in that in specifying these areas. Um, uh, 
and then also we may have, such as we have in uh, Hutchinson, there may be a company that's uh, actually doing that work of taking uh, organic material, composting them, producing uh, for a sale product um, up in uh, Hutchinson at Creekside, Creekside Organics or Creekside. Yeah. And I believe they started, did they start as a city operated business? I can't I know it's been pre-2001, I know in 2001, major expansion, but anyway, so, um, so under the, uh, under the, the business best practice number 25, there's sort of three, you know, depending on sort of the fine level of how a city wants to promote those um, uh, businesses that are uh, actually doing that work of producing a product that can be used by cities, uh, we sort of mention them in there, we sort of weave them in. So I think uh, that is all I had to say to people. And that's it. So uh, I think my uh, it is it's a Kayla Kayla. So uh, Kayla Walsh, uh, working in the assistance division, um, along with myself at the MPCA, um, um, taken over from Emily Barker, who's now at Saint, yeah, yeah Saint Louis Park. So Emily is uh, their specialist in uh, organics. So she'll kick off, and then we have several other speakers. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Ah. All right. Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Kayla Walsh. I work at the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency. I've been there for about a year now. I'm so excited to go over for Emily Barker. And I uh, specialize in organic collection and marketing, as well as commercial recycling. So, um, going to give a little overview today of how cities can be involved in collection of organics, as well as in promoting the use of that organics and marketing final compost. Just a quick show of hands, I guess, who in here is representing a city that may already have a compost program? Is there anyone in here? Great. Is anybody thinking about it critically? Yeah, we got it. Okay, cool. So I'm just going to start off with a really <coughs> basic overview of what are organics. When I say organics, what am I talking about for city collections? That includes anything um, that's food scraps, non-recyclable paper, compostable plastics, which means that they need to have the BPI or Cedar Grove certification in order to be considered compostable, um, and yard waste. And there are certain cities where yard waste is co-collected with food waste, and we can get into those details later if you have questions on that. Um, in the state of Minnesota, organics currently accounts for 40% of our waste stream. About 31% of that is food waste and our organic material, and then that other 10% is the non-recyclable paper or compostable paper. So together, that's 41%. So that's a lot of low-hanging fruit that could be recycled, and organics counts as a recyclable material under state statute. <coughs> the metro area, Twin Cities metro area, as a recycling goal of 75% to reach by 2030, and collection of organics is a really easy way to reach our numbers to help us get there. Um, if you're from a city from greater Minnesota, their collection goals are 35% by 2030, as set by the legislature in 2014. So this is um, a more specific overview of breaking down Minnesota's waste stream from a 2013 waste characterization report. You can see, um, this here is the organic section, and compostable paper counts as organic, but we broke it out separately to show how big of a, a section it makes up, about 10%, where the organics is 31%. Um, this chunk is plastic, 18%, and um, recyclable paper is 13%. Um, but this data suggests that in an ideal world, we could reach that 75% recycling goal, and that's why we define it as a goal that we want to see um, high in the sky technically possible to reach and something that we can all strive for. So organics recycling, we do see it as a growing trend across Minnesota. Hundreds of schools across the state do organics collection. Um, sports arenas and venues like TCF Stadium, CHS Field, um, the Excel Center and the Science Museum all collect organics. Events such as Rock the Garden, um, other concerts and community events and weddings and parties can collect organics. 
Um, you can get resources from your county, actually, like bins and um, lining to those bins if you're interested in hosting an event. And sometimes that can be subsidized to the city. Um, the Three Rivers Park District is a great example of this, and Minneapolis Park. So parks and outdoor areas are collecting organics as well. We've also seen an uptick in uh, residential collection with multi-units and some um, uh, collection systems going online with multi-unit dwellings as well as um, cities such as Minneapolis is actually a that city, but they're a great example of organic collection, curbside collection. They actually have one of the most successful programs in the country right now with a 40% option rate, and they're seeing very little contamination. So all of that increased interest across the state has led to this uptick in our organic collection. So from 2008 to 2015, it looks like it more than doubled. Part of that is because we started um, accounting for yard waste in these numbers. So this also, since 2008, means that that includes yard waste that's being picked up in the same <coughs> However, this does also account for all of the municipal and um, business collection systems that have gone online recently. And when we're talking about managing food waste, I think it's good to take a step back and note that this is the EPA's food waste recovery hierarchy, and the primary goal is source reduction. So figuring out ways not to create that food waste in the first place is key. The second thing would be to feed hungry people, so reusing that food and taking it to food shelves and food banks. Um, feeding animals, food to hogs is a really popular program especially in rural areas. And then we have industrial uses that account for things like anaerobic digestion, where that food waste could be going towards producing heat and energy as well as possible. And then under that is compost. And last but not least, we really want to keep food waste out of landfills, which is why we turn to composting in a lot of cases. Composting is definitely better than sending organic waste to landfills, because in landfills it creates methane, and it creates toxic leaches. Uh, we can recover that valuable material, as I mentioned, with the digestion. We can get heat and energy from it, um, as well as the compostable digestate from the anaerobic digestion. And it increases economic activity across the state and reduces greenhouse gases. Compost can be used to support plant growth. And it reduces the need for applying a lot of fertilizers and pesticides, since it's a natural um, fertilizer for plant growth. And it increases drought resistance because compost can actually retain up to eight times its weight in water. So that's why we see it being used a lot in uh, long roadsides for projects with the DOT, and I'll talk a little bit about that compost use later. Um, so it also helps prevent pollution. It acts as sort of a filter. A lot of pollutants can bind to the compost, um, and <coughs> and um, these are all things I'll talk about a little bit later, and that cities can incorporate into local ordinances to make sure that they're using compost in, a, in the most beneficial way possible. So right now, about 23% of the state's population has an organic drop site in their city. So about a quarter of Minneapolis residents have access to compost in some way, shape, or form. Um, about 8 or 9% of the state's population actually has access to a curbside program like that of Minneapolis. Minneapolis is an opt-in program, so everybody's paying for it on their trash bill. But at the same time, then you as a resident have to seek out that opportunity to participate in the program. And the city will deliver you a bin. And um, they're seeing less than 1% contamination in some cases because it's an opt-in program and because residents are choosing to partake in that themselves. Um, it's not being forced on them. It's being seen as a choice that residents are able to make. So our goal is to definitely increase this number and get more drop sites in more locations and more curbside collection programs. This graph sort of displays um, the spacing of our compost sites across Minnesota, just to give you a better geospatial view. The one on the left denotes all of our yard waste sites. So we have over 100 yard waste sites, but that doesn't collect food waste from residents. The one on the right has about eight blue dots that you can see. Um, a lot of them are clustered around central Minnesota and the Twin Cities metro area, but these are the places that accept like residential food waste. So if you're going to start a similar program, this is um, not yard waste. This is where it would go. Or a great 
way, if you don't have access to that in your city, would be to create a small, a small job site. Um, Hutchinson is actually a really good case, and we'll talk about this in the intro. Hutchinson started their residential program a long time ago, before 2001, and they've since grown to a bagging operation. They're sort of taking it full circle, so they're collecting residential food scraps and organics, and they're processing them on site, and they're creating this really marketable product that they're mixing with black dirt and being used for landscape programs and um, DOT programs their area and a lot of residents are picking up bags, bags for free um, or subsidized bags and then they're using them in their garden. So it's really a closed loop system and they're seeing the benefits of um, their compost use and when you get that bag of black dirt or soil and compost that you're able to use in your own garden and you know that it came from your own house, there's definitely that sense of community surprise that you can get from that as well. And I think it really means that we're changing the way that we think about compost. We're not thinking about it as food scrap waste management anymore. We're trying to turn that corner and think about it as product manufacturing, bringing jobs to your city, bringing jobs to your community. Um, in 2014, we changed the rule structure of how to set up a compost site, which means that if you have under 120 cubic yards of compost on one space, that means that you're changing <coughs> And that means that you qualify as a small compost site, which is a new category. And the fact that you don't need a permit means that it gives a lot of cities a lot of leeway to create their own space and to do what they need to do um, in terms of collection. And um, I think a lot of cities have ordinances that talk about odor management and um, nuisance control and making sure that if you have a small site, it's not too close to a residential area where it would cause problems or be smelly or that you're turning it every once in a while. You have somebody managing it that knows what they're doing. Um, and this is different than a factory compost site because at a small compost site you can actually accept things like poultry litter as long as it stays on site and the compost is used um, on site. So like let's say that you are a college campus that has chickens. If you have your small compost site on your college campus and you're taking that poultry litter and then you're using that poultry litter compost after it's been processed safely and it meets all of the health and public safety standards, then that could be used on your college campus for <coughs> landscaping. Um, so those are sort of the main differences. Things that you still would need a solid waste permit for are those eight really big manufacturers that I showed you on that map earlier. That would be the source, either a source-separated compost facility or a solid waste compost facility in that um, new category of an SSOM facility just kind of gives them more flexibility to manage their material. Um, if you have questions, we can talk after about that. Um, but I think that the real opportunity for cities in particular is to start a small compost site. You'll most likely see small compost sites at um, urban farms or community gardens. Some multi-family unit dwellings will start one in their apartment complex if you get a lot of buy-in from the people in your apartment complex. Universities, like I mentioned, if you're a college campus, it's really great for your eco club or whatever to start a compost, compost site. Um, and this is also a really great option for rural communities because they can, everybody can bring their organics to a central location and it can be managed by somebody uh, in the city there. Drop sites are another really great option. The first drop site was created in St. Paul at, in the Mount McAllister Girls and Community. And they sort of piloted this option and found that it was really successful for their city and they have over a thousand people participating um, per year there. So you collect your organics in your home and when that your little container is full, you can bring it to your job. <coughs> These are often co-located with yard sites or transfer stations if you're thinking about a place that fits to put them. If you already have a yard waste site, set up another bin there. Um, standalone sites, the so sites that are co-located with yard waste sites, um, they supply info to their county, they report to their county, they don't need to report to the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency. So I included a link at the bottom here, so when we send out these slides, you'll have that information, you can back over to that page and see exactly what requirements you would have to set up a drop site. So again, the two most popular options for cities, I think, would be the drop site or the small compost site. Um, 
we do have a lot of um, model language if you're thinking about starting a site. So this is available on the Minnesota Composting Council's website. Um, this was developed by the Association of Recycling Managers and MNCC, the Minnesota Composting Council. Um, and they gained stakeholder input from a lot of people across greater Minnesota and the metro. They definitely wanted to blend of those perspectives. And this is a guide that's intended to sort of facilitate discussion and provide different guidance for the best way to start a backyard and a small <coughs> site. So this is a really crucial resource um, that I, we will link to on Green Subsidy. And then let's say that you're trying to educate residents in a business setting and you don't know exactly what to, how to label your bins, how to co-locate them. This is an organic recycling style guide and it was developed collaboratively by, again, the Association of Recycling Managers, MPCA, Minnesota Composting Council, Rams, Swim Club, Large Scale Composters, everybody had a say in this document. And um, it's really a work of art because to get all of these people to took a lot of patience and, and practice and um, we ended up with this organic recycling style guide which agreed to use the language not composting but when you put on your sign the sign should read organic for recycling. You could be collecting organic for anaerobic digestion or organic for farm or you know for to feed pigs. So it's really important that like when you go to the sign in St. Paul, for example, it says organic for recycling. And that's the terminology that all of these stakeholders agreed upon, and that's what we're trying to standardize the messaging across Minnesota, across the state. So this would be actually a really interesting guide to take a look at. Take a look at your own program as you're developing your own program. This will have guides on how to co-locate bins, um, maybe where the best place is to put those bins in your, you know, in the facility as well as colors. Everybody agreed that green is composting. <laughs> uh, and as well as labeling. And it has some resources on how to make your own signs to uh, some resource recycling. There's a sign maker that you can all take a look at as well. Um, we also have a model city hauler contract. And I don't know if you're able to click on the, on the link. So this talks about general collection requirements and definitions of terms. So let's say your city needs to agree on a term for bulky recycling. What's a bulky item? This is like a, a sort of a, a template for those types of definitions. Um, making sure that you include insurances. Great. Um, insurances in um, your contract between the city and the hauler. Um, how to handle reporting to make sure that that hauler is reporting to the county and the county is reporting to the MPCA or the hauler is reporting directly to the MPCA. All of those assurances are built into this model ordinance. So that's really critical and if you want to just scroll through so people can get the idea of this is all set up as you know an official document and this has been used by a couple of other cities across Minnesota. So this is the definition section. This is going to be one of those critical resources Resources um, as well, and also the MPCA score report um, can provide grant dollars and development of in implementation of food waste programs or programs for collection and transportation of food donated to humans to feed animals and to processing of source separated compostables following anaerobic digestion. So if you have a program like that, you could get grant funding from your county and basically help for work. So that's also something that we can touch on um, you know, in our conversation if you want to know more about the grant opportunity through score funding. Um, so this is an excerpt from best practice 22.5. Five, I think it's the last paragraph, and it says, cities are encouraged to adopt policies that expand markets for compost, so not only collection mechanisms, but compost marketing. <laughs> what we were talking about earlier when I said we're sort of changing the way that we view composting, not just as a collection mechanism for food waste, but as a product manufacturing. We're talking about how we can market compost. So adopting policies that improve economic
economic sustainability of organic selection and management programs. And um, a lot of these programs and actions, cities specify the use of compost and soil amendment. Um, and this also ties to purchasing actions, forestry actions, stormwater, and park actions. A lot of this stems from MPCA's work with MnDOT in incorporating compost into their 3890 compost spec. So the process began in October 2016 when the Commissioner of the Pollution Control Agency met with the Commissioner of the Department of Transportation and they decided that using compost in MnDOT projects was a priority for both of them. So then we worked with MnDOT's team to rewrite their spec. They publish a new set guide every two years, I believe. And so this year it was up for revision. And we looked at this spec called 3890 Compost Spec. And we tried to figure out how to get more compost used across the state. Um, right now, Minnesota is using about 5,000 cubic yards of compost. And in other states, they'll use 14,000 cubic yards on one project. So although it's great that MnDOT is incorporating it already, we have a, a big opportunity there to expand MnDOT's use. Um, so we talked to a lot of different stakeholders. We talked to the Minnesota Composting Council, um, people who accept compost, composters across the state and the industry, different NGOs, um, different non-governmental organizations, as well as other state DOTs, so Florida, Oregon, and Washington, Texas, California, seeing what they're doing and what, what they would recommend. The new spec book revision was meant to be released late summer, and that's not out yet. However, we know that MnDOT took our recommendations to heart, and from the draft that we've seen, we can pretty confidently say that our changes will be incorporated in the 3890 MnDOT spec. So, what does that really mean? When MnDOT is compost, or contracting for use of compost, they split their compost into three different grades. Grade one is used for turf establishment, and that's solely from the feedstock or the input of manure. So that's manure. Grade two is compost that's from yard waste, and that's used for landscape and planting. And grade three is a mix of one and two. So what's missing from these feedstocks? Food waste. MnDOT hadn't used any food waste before um, in their compost, which really limited where they were allowed to get their compost from. Our eight biggest compost producers use food waste across the state, and they're not allowed to bid on any of these projects because of that. So in our talks with Linda, we wanted them to really evaluate the product, the final product, and not the feedstock from which it came. Because if you compare like a data sheet on the phosphorus and the oxygen levels and the, you know, the different heavy metals from a yard waste derived compost versus a food waste derived compost, they're going to be pretty similar. You're not going to be able to tell the difference. Um, and that's kind of the message that we wanted to send to Linda as well. Our recommendations were to add source separated organic material. So that's the organic material that's being source separated in a municipal curbside program or in a business recycling program um, to the grade two. So that grade two, which is contract, is the most popular one that we usually contract for. So that's why we chose to incorporate it into grade two. And then we also wanted to require SPA testing. Um, and that's something that you can require in your city or well, if you want to do that to be on a specific project, um, require SPA seal of testing assurance through the U.S. Composting Council, and that's just going to make sure that it's a safe, quality product that's mature and will protect public health. MnDOT was really reticent to use compost for a very long time because in the past we have bought compost from MSW, Municipal Solid Waste Manufacturing, which means that. Um, after processing all the recycling in the trash, we would take out the little tiny bits of organics and compost them. Inevitably, that would be incredibly contaminated and you would see glass along the highways and that did not appreciate that, rightfully so. So that kind of tarnished their image of compost. We no longer make compost like that. That's why it's for separated organics. It's not going to be as contaminated. In fact, I was sifting through the Minneapolis organics and we were, you know, um, doing waste sort, and we found less than 1% contamination in some of our roads, and that's incredible. 
So we're, they're not going to see glass on the side of the road with that type of process anymore. They're not going to see meat and bones that didn't break down. That's all breaking down in a commercial compost site. Um, and that is also a little bit worried about high phosphorus levels in compost because it's really nutrient dense. It has a high organic content, so they want to be careful where they lay it, um, especially up in the iron range when you have a lot of erosion going into lake streams and rivers in order to protect those waters of the state. Um, so that's just something to monitor. Monitor, and they're also worried about you know will we get different quality batches from different people? How do we ensure that compost is a homogenous project? And that's all um, conversations that we worked through with MinBat to make sure that we were on the same page and that they knew that um, the variability between batches wasn't all that great and probably wouldn't affect their their projects. Trucking can be really cost prohibitive because this is the same map that we looked at earlier. Um, it's really tough for MinDOT to contract with one of these compost facilities and go all the way up to the mid let's say. However, in some cases, they're going to be sending black dirt there three times, um, but the project could have been done with just one load of compost because that compost retains more water and it gives the job done more thoroughly and you're not going to need to pay for three loads. You're only going to need to pay to truck one. So in some cases, it is cost prohibitive, definitely. In other cases, you need to think about that, um, the cost benefit of only needing to lay it down one time. So what does MinDOT really use compost for anyway, besides roadside planting? Um, it's a great erosion control mechanism. So I know that along the Iron Range in Lake Superior, you have a lot of deep hills going into the lake. And so compost is used for that slope stabilization because it'll absorb eight times its weight in water. It'll make sure that you don't have that erosion running down because the um, plants will be able to establish their roots better and faster. Um, it's also used as a fertilizer for, let's say, pollen air plants along the roadside, um, better turf establishment, and improved water holding. Um, after a lot of construction sites are being driven on several times, you have that heavy machinery going through that compacts the soil. They actually call it green cement because water doesn't flow through it. Um, if you dip in compost, that makes it more porous and it'll hold water and it'll just re reinvigorate your soil and it'll have that hold for that organic matter to establish and that creates a healthier soil and you can grow better plants faster. Um, a lot of the times you'll see these, um, what we call compost stocks at construction sites and that's, filled, that's a stock that's filled with compost and that makes certain that you don't get the pollutants running into the storm drain, you don't get the erosion running through into the storm drain on a construction site. That's called perimeter control. And as I mentioned earlier, a lot of other um, states are using compost more aggressively than Minnesota in their Department of Transportation products, projects. So Connecticut is one example. Um, they use two different plots along the roadside. In one plot they use compost and in one plot they use their regular soil, what they would normally contract for. They had a 40% um, mortality rate, so 40% of the plants in the regular one died. And in the compost pet plot, it was 100% fine. They, they had perfect turf establishment. And we're seeing that more and more in, up in different areas. Um, Florida also incorporates a lot of compost use. They used it for vegetative cover. So that means that they had better plant growth in plant in plots with compost versus in plots without compost. Um, and in New Hampshire, they use 1,000 cubic yards annually of compost just in their roadside. So that's kind of the standard for what they use planting along the road. Egan is a perfect case study sort of of this compost water connection and stormwater connection. Um, compost is really working hard to protect the waters of the state. You can think of it as a, many, a mechanism to make sure that we don't pollute water. And Egan really took hold of this idea and they have a great um, case study we can take a look at. So Egan is in Carver County and Carver County really wants to use compost as a water management best practice. Egan uses compost for soil on post-construction projects that are over 10,000 square feet. Um, and just to 
give you sort of an idea of how aggressive this goal is, Denver requires like four cubic yards of compost per 1,000 square feet. Um, Egan's is much more aggressive goal than that, so that's really cool that they're doing better than Denver. Um, and this is a, a note from the actual um, plan from Egan. So this is what it would look like between the city of Egan contracting for a compost in a roadside project. This is an actual language that you would see in them trying to fulfill their permit. So it says that you have 12 inches of soil loosening required in all landscape areas, including lawn areas. That's that disking in a compost to make it wet, more porous, to make it you know, not green cement. So the water actually infiltrates the soil, you get better plant growth. Excuse me. And then it says that you incorporate three inches of the MIN.3890 grade two compost. And that's why it's critical that we made that change to MIN.3890 spec, because there are so many cities that use that spec to contract for their own um, landscaping purposes. So that requires that, that grade two compost, which will hopefully now require or include food waste compost be mixed into proposed plantings and lawn areas prior to planting. Um, and then it says that you just need to notify your city for inspection of the soil amendment process prior to installation um, to make sure that you have proper irrigation and seeding and plant materials and verify that your soil restoration is complete. And a lot of um, permits, especially through the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency, you need to have a certain level of uh, plant growth and trip establishment in your landscaping project, and it has to be um, living for a certain amount of time. If you uh, use compost and contract for the 3890 min spec, you will have better um, turf establishment, better vegetative cover. And you'll reach that sooner, and it'll actually save money because a lot of times the contractors won't have to spend so much time out on the actual site. They can get rid of their permit faster, their MS4 permit through the NPCA. Um, and I think we do still have to link to the Green Cities Egan yeah. uh, requirement. In their actual ordinance, their city ordinance, they don't specifically call out compost, they call out organic matter. But what that really means is you can see this in every permit that they contract for with their um, with their city. This is what they use. So that 30 days, 90 grade two in that spec. So that pretty much actually covers it. I know I whipped right through everything, but that is how we are hoping to promote compost um, collection through small sites and drop sites, and then also promoting the use of compost that is vegan um, and using that specifically um, in construction and landscaping projects. Anybody have any questions or should we move right along? Questions or questions on the um, uh, webinar? On the webinar. Okay. Yep. Okay. Feel free to connect with me after too. Yeah, maybe we should uh, say so. I'm on Green Step uh, City's website under Best Practice 22. Tim Farnan is the uh, contact person there, but contact Tim and Tim and Taylor work very, very closely together. So, uh, yep. even now, just click there. Thank you. Thanks, Kayla. I think next, uh, uh, Angie. Hi, I'm Angie Burdash, Minnesota Pollution Control Agency. I work in the small business program. Uh, our our program in general has helped uh, small businesses understand their regulatory obligations, but we also do a series of proactive outreach and projects. And this is this um, working on commercial recycling is one that I'm currently working on. And so. I wanted to bring up the um, MPCA state mandate around commercial recycling because it is um, fairly directly related to everything that was just kind of covered within best practice 22. And remind me, is it was it 22.7 where it's, it's mentioned the mandate is mentioned? Either um, they follow the mandate or they can uh, right, aspire yeah. to have something similar in their city. Right. Because Correct. in the metro, right, yeah. Yeah, because um, I'll, I'll get to this, but it, it is only for the metro area. But so there's, so keeping that in mind within 22, 
I'm going to quickly just cover what the mandate is and then connect it to uh, how you can also meet best practice 25 too with the, with the mandate. So that's kind of the bigger picture. So, um, so uh, the recycling mandate, the MPCA has as of January 1st, 2016, uh, all commercial building owners with at least one tenant within their building, uh, within the NAICS codes 42 to 81, <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> <laughs> and that uh, produce more than four cubic yards of trash per week are required to recycle. So just to get back to like what's four plus cubic yards, right? If you go back to this, this um, everyone should probably be able to recognize that kind of a trash container. That's uh, and we have this on the website too. That's what four plus cubic yards would be. Um, and just for so just for an example, the you can always look up NAICS codes, but in general, 42 to 81 encompasses things like hotels, restaurants gas stations, dry cleaners, um, like service providers, like banks, um, law firms, uh, marinas, food trucks, brew pubs, not breweries, <laughs> but it, very, it does very specifically exclude manufacturing. And also within the criteria is that they must recycle at least three type, types of materials. So a material, a type of material is paper, plastic, metal, um, a stream, and you have to have at least three. And it does, um, many places offer what's called co-mingling, essentially one bin where you can th throw all of your recycles, recyclables in as long as there's three different types going in there that counts. And then um, we like to, of course, talk about the benefits of uh, following the mandate, which is one big one is that you can uh, save money by uh, implementing, starting or improving your recycling program. And uh, one way to do that is um, in, I'm, I'm pretty sure every metro county anyway has tax exemptions on recyclables. So if you only have trash service, you're paying sometimes pretty steep taxes on those recycling bins, but if you choose to implement a recycling program, you save all of the taxes by um, diverting, sorting out your recyclables and converting them into the recycling bin. So that's something to uh, advertise as a benefit. Um, so I just wanted to talk about kind of what we're up to. We are, are at the beginning stages of um, resource development. We have a new web page that um, just kind of brings things up to speed, refreshes the information that's out there. We really want to highlight um, and encourage people to look into their county programs, um, at least in the Twin Cities. Uh, all Most counties have um, the opportunity for businesses to utilize um, program called WasteWise where they will come in and do an assessment of your facility and help you understand uh, what uh, things you can do either in the front of the house or in the back, where to put bins, um, that kind of thing, looking at your bills, even renegotiating your contract. And then in addition to that, once you get an assessment, uh, the county itself has um, grant funding available to implement. Uh, some of the recommendations. So it's really a good thing. We just want to be a partner with the counties that are offering these great programs and letting people know that uh, they are available. So we just have a, we have the web page and um, I'm currently in the middle of putting together a package, a media package with artic uh, larger articles that can be sent out through newsletters, uh, shorter pieces that can, can be mentioned on web pages and other places. Um, you know, model social media tweets, that kind of thing. And so you can contact me for any of that. One thing I want to really mention about um, dissemination of information is we found a little surprisingly 
that um, when people are you know, going into Google and trying to find information about business recycling, they kind of, for some reason, naturally will go to their city web page first and, and end up skipping over the county resources. So any way that um, the cities can disseminate the information and point them in the right direction, I think will be most useful for your business. And that's just something to keep in mind. Um, but so we're, we're, like I mentioned, we're, we're highlighting the audits and grant funding that's already available. Uh, several of the counties have really good case studies that, are, that they've written up, particularly in um, restaurants. And um, some, like assisted living facilities, and there's um, a variety of, of good case studies that we're, we're, we're pointing out. And then uh, customizable bin labels. So, you, uh, like Kayla was saying, there was a big effort that uh, not of necessarily the same group, but several people in the recycling realm got together and decided what would work best for <coughs> messaging. So, there are labels you can use that you know, speak to people, hopefully, are, are very clear and simple. And, but you can also customize them based on like, you know, specialized things that you might have at your business that would make more sense to like put on the sign. Um, so I wanted to bring up the Green Step Cities web page, if you wouldn't mind. Uh, best practice 25. And I wanted to point out um, the best practice that speaks specifically to um, for connecting businesses to assistance providers. So it's related to business mandate in the sense of, so, so this one, number two. So create or participate in a marketing program to connect businesses with assistance providers, including utilities, who provide personalized energy waste or sustainability audits and assistance. So um, what we're talking, you know, this mandate and what I've been talking about and getting information about assistance providers directly relates to that best practice. Uh, if you would, yes, yeah, you can. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Um, what I want to point out within the best practice, if you wouldn't mind hitting star level examples, um, this is a reminder just as the, the single star. Uh, if you refer at least five businesses to assistance providers, you get credit for this best practice. And of course, there's more that you can do up to um, working with the businesses and getting outcomes of their actions on this one. And then um, just to further kind of illustrate the point where you hit on who's doing it. There are many cities that are doing a um, good job in this area. I did want to pull out White Bear right here, just because it's specifically related to this. There, there are many examples of people that have referred to utilities. Uh, White Bear in particular, essentially, without reading all of that. Um, <laughs> wow, what a thorough report. <laughs> essentially, they had waste flies come in and help several of their businesses and they got assessment and connected to grant funding and were able to um, do uh, exactly what we were talking about in terms of a mandate. So um, it's just you know nice to refer to those kind of examples. You know, if you're having trouble getting started or not quite you know understanding what you need to do, you know, um, one of the great things about this website of course is being able to call people if you've done it already. Um, and so, I just wanted to. So, uh, if you can go back. I just wanted to mention. Um, I didn't want to be completely metro focused. Uh, the mandate does just apply to the, metro, the Twin Cities metro area, but there are uh, ways for uh, cities in Greater Minnesota to do this as well. It's not quite as convenient, but um, waste-wise. Is if any businesses are a Minnesota Chamber member, they have free access to waste pipes to get an assessment. So they can come in and help them get set up. Or a business can um, 
know, become a member of Waste Life and have them come out and do that. So that is available for them. Um, uh, and, and Angie, is the energy uh, energy part of the chamber assistance package, is, is, are they connected or are they separate? They're connected, but different. Okay. Um, there's the, the waste life part, which is the, you know, obviously it's about waste, but they do um, try to do a little bit more sustainability stuff too. And then there's Energy Smart. Smart, huh? Energy Smart, which is also part of the chamber, and they do the energy auditing. Um, you know, that there really are quite a few programs available for energy audits. Um, that's one of them. I mean, you can always just, you, you can work with Energy Smart, you can work with Center for Energy and Environment, you can work with your local utility, and they provide, in most cases, free audits for your, for your businesses. So. But yes, they're part of the team. Um, and then just support, you know, check with the county in case there are other, you know, it differs by county, so I can't say for sure, but, you know, there might be a, uh, resources in terms of bins that might be available or, or possibly um, some, some counties can apply for Greater Minnesota Recycling Grants available through the MPCA. And one thing that they can use those grants for every year is pass through funding. So that's something to keep an eye on and or encourage your city county to apply for. Um, but beyond that, that is um, pretty much all I wanted to bring up along these lines. So are there any questions about that? Mm -hmm. So I have two questions. Um, my first one, when it comes to the mandate, um, why was there not anything put in there about the amount of recycling that they should have? Like so, it's mandated if they have four yards of trash per more or per more that they have to have recycling. But it 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 where I wish it would help me more is if it had um, some sort of a base quantity or or um, you know like they, like they can't they have to have so much based on the type of business that they are or what they or what they do um, because I feel like it gets right back into the same hole that we get into like specifically multi unit. Um, so you have that much waste, you have to have the recycling, but you know, depending on what the um, the business does or how much trash they produce, you know, they could put one little can there and and, and pass that. So um, pass which part? Well, I mean, the, they Are would compliance. they would be compliant in compliance with state, with law. state law. So it would be, I guess, it would be nice for cities and counties to if there was in the recycle, like if they put recycling in a very really small bin. Like yeah, and then oops, we pass because that's what we find. Um, happens is they don't have adequate enough recycling for the amount of people that visit the establishment or live there. Um, it's just, it would be nice if there was just a little bit more details in that. I guess that's my first thing. Um, and then with the grant funding um, through Minnesota WasteWise, we've also found that is there anything available that would help specifically for a multi-unit? So. We've gone through, we've done the, done the audits, we've increased recycling containers um, and done certain things, but now we run into an enclosure issue. Um, is there any funding out there that helps them um, stay within city compliance to now, you have recycling containers on site, but now you're out of city code because you don't have a place to screen them. So is there any funding that's available for that? Funding available to to help you build a different kind of computer uh, or increase the size. Um, score? Would it, no, it wouldn't be. Well, we've heard, Kayla, maybe you can help me on this one, but I know that we've, there is some efforts underway to look at, um, and there are different enclosure uh, requirements in different cities, which makes it harder, and I know there's efforts underway um, by the club to look at those and attempt to offer some guidance to make them a little bit more universal, for one. Um, I think every county's grant program is different, and I can't speak off the top of my head if they all, I the grant funding could be used for that. Dakota so County has a business program, and they offer uh, uh, the ability to build the enclosure if they do certain things. So Recycle, have a recycling program, and that program is around for X amount of time. So they do 
Did you find Well, I would hope if that's the case there that it would be the case in Germany, but I can't speak for for sure without looking up. I don't know what where that funding comes from, whether it's a uh, landfill money or whether it's could be or school or it could be passed with yeah, yeah. school or funds, yeah. yeah. Well, the intent to, I mean, I wasn't part of the discussions when the law came into being, but the intent, you know, to have three streams is that you are looking at your whole picture and trying to get um, at least most of your things recycled and not just putting a few in the corner and, you know, one pot can and then all of a sudden that's the stream. That's the intent. And then also the intent, I mean, theoretically, you you know, don't have to have recycling available in the whole building. I think the intent of the legislature and when they were having the discussion is that uh, businesses would recognize that they're making the effort anyway, that they would put recycling wherever uh, they can in their facility, fully capture as much as they can. But, you know, that's as far as it, it went, you know, in terms of the the, the three streams, you know, we're trying to get people, encourage people to get as much as they can. But, but did that help with the grant? Yeah. It's, yeah. Well, I mean, it's help you look at I'll it. look into what they have, but yeah. So I, I, I'm very familiar with this topic. Um, but also, this known as two organizations. You mentioned Minnesota Waste Wise, and I'm also exposed to Green Biz. And I'm wondering Green Biz Recycling, you guys. Do you mean um, Biz Recycling, Biz which recycling. is the Ramsey yeah. County? Yep. And so the two of them have parallels, overlap. What is the differentiation between using one and the other? Is it just a county differentiation, or is there a strong relationship? Well, uh, Biz Recycling is a partnership between Ramsey County and Washington County. They're working together um, to they came up with the brand, as it were, and they're um, pu pushing a, as much commercial recycling as they can through that. But essentially, they're using the model that I described, which is to contract with WasteWise to do the assessment. Okay. Um, I mean, what what all of the counties are doing is subsidizing the cost of WasteWise and, and by essentially buying the membership and then using them, and then those recycling as a partnership of the counties takes county funding and then they're offering grants once a business has an assessment. But the business recycling brand, I mean, they're putting, like if you look at their case studies, they all, um, almost all of them will have waste-wise in there. They've come up and done the assessment and talk about the benefits. And, I mean, they're doing a really good job of sharing what it is that they're doing with the program. So as a business or as a or as part of the city, you know, going through and the waste wise is probably a good first step, or is it looking at whatever else you've been doing and sort of trying to follow the one step of Piper Lake or, or I'm, 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 not, I'm basically asking what is, what is a good initial contact if you're a running business and looking at helping its recycling program or things of that nature? What is the first Well, if you're in the I would definitely let the county know so they're aware that you're interested. But um, contacting WasteWise first would be fine because they're, you know, they would come out and do the assessment if you're in one of the counties that covers it. And they would connect you to the grant program that's available. Thank you. All right, thank you, uh, uh, Angie. And so I think. Um, Uh, so, uh, Colleen Sinclair from Coon Rapids is going to talk about work that was, uh, she's done um, in her Good Stuff City and with a Green Corps member also. Yeah. Um, yeah. Right. Well, hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Colleen Sinclair. I'm the recycling coordinator for the city of Coon Rapids. Uh, what I'm going to show you today, so the, the whole thing where you hear a long, this is a very long story short, you are truly getting a very long story and it's super short. 
um, thing. And so um, bear with me, and we'll we'll kind of go through it. Um, so our multi-unit recycling program. So we all know the struggle is this big, ugly elephant in the room about um, multi-unit recycling. There's so many hurdles to it, um, and many of us have been working on this for so many years, and we don't make much progress. Um, so there's a few things that drive why, why do we want multi-units, you know, why do we want recycling of these multi-units? For one, we want to work with that MPCA goal, um, you know, and try to get to that 75%. It's a great potential to capture our tonnage. There's so many people living in a small area that we know we're just missing out on this. Um, for Coon Rapids specifically, and I know some other communities that are really working on this right now, we're really focusing on equality. Um, we want to make sure that regardless of where you live, you have the same opportunities that everyone else does. Um, and so that's kind of our big, our big voice and our advocate message behind, behind this. Um, so with that, we have a really deep recycling um, feel in our city. We have our drop-off center there that we run, um, and we always make our goals every year through Anoka County Tour Program. Um, so um, recycling our multi-units, the last 12 years that I've been there, we've made very little progress until just recently. Um, and then we are part of the um, Metro Coalition of the Multi-Unit Recyclers, which actually meets right after this. We were really fortunate to um, get two years worth of Minnesota Green Corps members. So um, we decided two years ago to apply for our first member and, and really try to tackle the multi-unit beast. Um, the, the great thing behind Minnesota Green Corps is it's an 11-month um, paid staff person. So unlike in the past, we've had short two- or three-month interns who come in. You don't make a lot of progress. Um, and so the Green Corps um, members are amazing. They're all um, usually pretty uh, recent graduates out of college. Um, so we applied for year one, and then we ended up applying for year two because we were making such good progress. And I wish we would have applied for year three, but I didn't know we would be where we are today. But uh, so year one, we had Tanya. Tanya did. We have 57 buildings within our city. Um, Tanya did <clears throat> visited every single property, did a site audit, took pictures, um, and then she gave everybody a grade. So every property has like a report card based on like a 10 point criteria, um, from from their signage to frequency of pickup, their waste collar. Um, we really looked at what they had there, and we assigned it a grade, so we kind of knew what we were working on. That pretty much took the entire first year. So year number two, when Steph came in, she really got to do the fun stuff. So she tried, um, she had 18 different pilot programs going on within our city. Um, and so she did a lot of surveys, marketing, she provided a lot of materials. These magnets over here, you wouldn't believe it, but these have been the biggest change and success point that we've had. We started off with magnets, we now have them, they're stickers, and we require every building in our city to have them on their containers. Um, and they, they're they much even bigger than that. So if you were to look at a standard six or an eight yard container, they're like this big, they take up a good chunk of your container. Um, with these specific stickers installed, we saw huge increases. I mean, we were, we were looking at, um, I can't even think of the percentages right now, but I mean, we would see like 100% jump at a building um, just by sticking these these on there. And we first tried it. We did it was a pilot. We did it at like three or four different buildings to kind of watch and measure the progress. And we would do weekly audits. Um, and now we have them citywide. They're at every single building. Is this part of an ordinance that you are requiring? This? Well, we wanted to do it by an ordinance, but our city council doesn't like to force things if they don't need to. And so, um, really, the waste haulers all agreed to just allow it without having the city ordinance force them. And so, we'll see where that leads in the future because right now everybody's cooperating and they said, no, go ahead, do it. Um, so, every waste hauler, and um, throughout commercial, we have eight different licensed waste haulers, um, and they all agreed. So, right now, every hauler has them. We just go in there and stick them up. Um, but they rather they would rather take that approach than have it be forced. And, and as long as they were willing to work with us, we just kind of met in the middle on that one. And they, oh, but they change the containers, right? They pull one out. 
No, they're all empty on site. Yep. Yep. But you could, if through, through just as your staff license haulers, couldn't you simply put it in as a licensing provision? And we could, and that's a possibility. We're kind of right now just kind of seeing how this whole thing plays out a little bit, and then it may be, if, if that would be my next step if it becomes problematic. Problematic, right now, it's not. Problematic. Yeah, that's good. Right yeah. now, it's all, all eight ways toddlers have said, no, let's, let's all agree and we can take care of it that way. Yeah. Yeah. And we might get to this. Um, the stickers, I've had trouble just sticking. So are these like really good vinyl stickers or are they expensive? Or? They are pretty pricey. I don't I don't remember the cost offhand. Um, the city of Fridley and our and myself, we kind of have a joint purchasing thing going on. We have one printer who's designed and printing them all, so we kind of have a bulk purchasing thing going on. Um, so far the ones that have been in place have lasted. Um, you know, there's you know, we have one building for it. We set fire to their bin, so that one we have to reverse. But all in all, they're holding up pretty well. So I had I, I had some uh, well, they were like bumper stickers, but they had a lot of these things to recycle only. And it yeah. Was a wrap, but the, the sun ate them up. I mean, it was just yeah. it's worth the investment. Well, these are yeah, they're this special UV, you know, yeah. ink and process, and you know, so far they've been in place for you know over about a year. And we haven't seen any any issues. So. Great. So yeah. if we want to copy, can we give you a call? Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. And we're hoping the more cities, um, you know, this is, I mean, these really look familiar to you because they're the same ones that we use everywhere. I mean, they're in the airports. They're in the, this is the same the same style and design that countywide, and I know throughout other counties, we use <coughs> the same design. Um, and so it's a, a centralized message. We want everybody to always see those same same containers. Uh, but yeah, so biggest, um, and then also um, with tracking the properties and, and giving changes, um, recommendations, you know, just people changing their container size too. I mean, obviously it's a no-brainer, but to convince somebody of that is a pretty big undertaking. So the problems that we entail. So um, along this path, we never decided or never knew we would get to a one-to-one -one ratio of city code, but along this we were just kind of, things just kind of fall into place. And so constant turnover. We have some managers who've been in place for 10 plus years, and we have some buildings who literally every three months have a new property manager. So you have all of this going on. There's, there's no two that are the same. Um, and then when programs, when new managers come in, some don't explain what it was, and they had no idea it was there. And then you have some who do know about it, but they have other things to worry about, they don't want to continue it, and so you just you start all over again. Um, and then our past education, just been kind of word of mouth. Um, all of this is just constant attention. It's not sustainable, and we don't have enough staff time to keep redoing this all the time. And so that's kind of why we went down this path. Problem number two: we've all read these articles and seen things on the news, you know. Good old Amazon Prime, I know it comes to my house on a regular basis, but um, these these buildings, these are examples of some photos from actual buildings in our city, and you can see how the recycling is just overfilled. One of the biggest requests I have right now with working with buildings is they want some education and some door hangers or whatever they can give people to break down your cardboard. It just is a, just a space hog. Um, but, you know, that's, we all see this. Is happening. So problem number three, um, you know, there's not enough space. Waste haulers are really great at providing the amount of trash space they need for their tenants. Or the, the multi-unit managers are great for right-sizing the amount of trash they need, but nobody ever thinks about the recycling. So um, on average, um, you know, we, I mean, we all know this. We work in the field, but you can see. Oh, so this is how much trash they have, and that's how much recycling that they provide in general. And so, yeah. and from all the site audits that we've done, we see so much recycling in the trash simply because there's no place for them to put it. Um, and then one of the things that we kept hearing from a complaint from a, from a few of our property managers was, 
we are holding, we want to hold them to such a higher level than our single family homes. It's so not the case. I have all the studies and numbers in the world that say they're way down here. So then we came up with a city recommendation to require one-to-one -one recycling versus trash, you know, in trash um, at all apartment buildings. We've really when we work with, with buildings all the time, or schools, or office buildings, or anywhere, we always have had that, you always pair recycling with, with, with trash. You always have containers together that always keep them safe. That's just the way we all work. It's our, our normal process that all of us use. So for us, it was just common practice, but we thought, you know, I think we can make this work here. So while it was never our intention to get to this point, we thought we would try it and see what happens. And so, we worked with our city council and put a code together, and um, it passed on July 6th and was effective September 1st of 2017. And this is just an example. So when we went through and we rated all of our buildings, so this top, this is the setup at one of our buildings. And you can see they have garage space, garage, 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 garage. And they have their trash between the garages. So this was the before up here. They were ranked the worst property in our city, number 57 out of 57. They had an F. They have just everything that they had in place just was not a good program. So after working with us and giving the recommendation, they are now our top-notch, highest-rating building in the city. Um, and you can see down here the increase that they've seen in recycling. And so. And they actually save money. And this is the thing we keep telling everyone. If you let us let, you know, let us help you with this, we have enough tools and resources that we can um, walk you through these things um, and save you money, you know, and provide your residents that opportunity. So, uh, yeah, it, it, it was, can you just go back? Yep. Yeah. So what was, um, okay, how did you figure that out? I mean, that's just fairly interesting. Right. By doing site visits, like I said, we've been really fortunate to have two years of a staff person who's done nothing but this. She's visited every property every week, looked inside their trash, um, and then just, just from knowing that the standards that we've always worked with, we know that, that so much of the percentage that's in trash is recyclable, so we know we can extrude that into source separate. And so it's a lot of education, a lot of working with the buildings, and then the big thing that typically wins the over is that money savings. And so we know one of the common things that we would hear when we're working with this is, you know, say you have a multi-unit that has an eight-yard trash, and we say now you have to have recycling. They automatically go, oh my God, I don't, I have to add eight yards recycling. It's going to cost me so much money. And I said, well, nothing has changed with people who live here. You don't need, you're doubling your volume, and you don't need to do that. So what we need to do is we reduce your trash, increase your recycling, you save money, everything fits in one nice little area, and it just is a win. win. And so after we tested it out, and I think we worked with like five or six properties doing these pilot programs, we saw how successful it was, and then that's kind of what led us down this path. Can you explain the 96-gallon containers instead of a larger year? Well, the 96 gallon containers, um, a lot of buildings use those because they're easy. Uh, but what we see um, specifically in this setup here is people would come in here, they work, they fill these first ones up, and they never go back here. Or we have some buildings who have three rows of them, and people only use that front row, nobody ever rotates. And then with all of the cardboard, you just can't, um, you get four boxes in there, it fills up a bin, and then you just lost all that space. And so typically when they switch to the dumpster, um, it just it's just easier. You can fit more in there and you don't have the box issue. So why did they keep the ninety six gallon? Just because they were there? Well this is the before oh, and this oh, is the after. Oh, yeah. So this is what they looked like pre you know previous to our, yeah. our working with them. Yep. Yeah. And then after it's okay it all blends together. Um, this is what it is now. So they eliminated that um, so, Colleen, was this pilot project paired with giving containers to each uh, resident, each household? Well, we have um, carry down to the yeah. So we have this dumpsters. this little folder of things that we give managers, and in there is a bunch of resources that we can give them. And one of those is the tote. You've all seen that tote, the blue tote with the handle that holds like the trash bag or the the grocery bag. Uh -huh. So 
So we have like 10 different things that they can order from us. Um, some of them assign them to each, each unit. Some of them, um, you know, just whoever wants one can take one. Um, every building does it a little bit differently, um, but they use that to um, bring their recycling from their apartment down to the area. So just say that this works out really, really well, and people are even recycling more. And but you have this ordinance. I mean, could it be uh, you know, a six-yard container with a two-yard garbage? Yes, the minimum is at least one little hour, so it's at least. At, yep. at okay. least, yeah. Yeah. This takes a drastic turn, though, so let's yeah. just oh, okay. see where oh. it is. Yeah, let's follow my path. Follow uh -oh. my path. There's more to come. There's, yes. <laughs> so some local examples, and, and not all of these are specifically one-to-one. -one. You'll see they are. Some came from, like this one here, um, it's from a property in Fridley. You can see how much money. We just wanted to show our city council that um, how much cost savings come with this with the right education. So this one down here, with this, we call this Fort Knox. It's a building within the city of Fridley. He's an ex-cop who's a manager, and he has cameras. You can't sneeze in the corner without him knowing you did it. So he he watches who comes in, who goes, who throws stuff away. He will find you, knock on your door, and and deal with it. So, but he has a it's a beautiful building, super you know low crime, low. I mean he's but let me tell you, if you walked into his office, you'd think you were at. I don't even know who has that many cameras. It's it's <laughs> there's walls walls of them. Um, this one specifically is one that we worked with here, and so um, this was one of our buildings. They had um, I don't remember if they had one or two different buildings, maybe two. But what we find is we have managers or a parent company who has say three buildings within the city. Each one of them has a separate trash contract. In my world, that makes no sense because it's just a waste of money. Um, so what we really did with them is we worked on getting them to one-to-one, -to -one, so you can see they have equal trash to recycling. Um, and then we helped them write their own contract and go out to bid. <coughs> so we put a template together so we could easily change it for any property. But they used that, rather than them having to take the time and effort to go out to every hauler, all eight of them, and try to get the right pricing, we helped them put the template together what is it that you want? Because they were saying, well, we wish this or we wish that. Well, why not make the waste collars work for you? Um, I do that in my job. I put my own bins together and go out and do all this stuff. So um, we helped them create their own contract. They went out for bid, went through the process. We were there to guide them through anything that they had questions for. Um, they started a new contract with a new waste collar, and they saved over $400 a month. I think that's a huge win. Also empowering them, letting them know that you don't always have to see that, you know, everybody's back and call all the time. Um, so the third thing that we've learned, so enclosures. So this this one has just been a bugger. And um, we, so 48% of, of all of our properties right now have a recycling, or have right, recycling and trash in the same enclosure. Um, from what we have found out, there's been several versions of our enclosure code throughout the year, and what we need to do is find out of all 57 properties, what um, what year were they built and what code applied to them at the time, because we had to figure out were some grandfathered in, were they, where were they in the scope of being non-compliant, because according to us at the time, we did all these audits, looking at our current code, only 35% of our, our buildings were in compliance for their enclosures. So we looked at it a little bit deep, deeper and found out that 1982 seems to be the, the, the turning point where the verbiage in the code went from a screen, screen waste area to an actual structure. So now we have to go in and kind of see what one applies to which building. But the, the, the thing that I think is disappointing and I, and I wish there'd be wiggle room, but I understand I'm not a builder, so I, I know that there's reasons for doing everything is if they want to adapt or do anything new to that enclosure, they have to come up to today's current code, um, which allows a lot more stringent. So you may have a building who was built 50 years ago who had a single fence line or used trees as their screen. 
Now if they want to make any changes, they have to go up the full, full enclosure and get everything in. That gets expensive. Um, space is an issue. We've got, um, you, you know, we downsize our trash and we increase the recycling. Many of them you saw in that picture, it fits right in there. It works really well. Um, but there are a number of them that it doesn't. And with enclosures, even on the same property, on one side of the building versus the other, there's room to grow over here. And on this side, they're locked by parking or they're locked by property behind them or something. So there's not, um, there's issues even from enclosure to enclosure on the same site. Um, so as we implemented the code, um, we got a mix of some feedback. Not all good. <laughs> um, some properties made these changes, had no issues. We'd get an email that said, hey, we're, we believe we're in compliant. We'd go out, we check. Yep, you are. we check with the hauler. Yep, we get them stickered up. Perfect. Um, a lot of them felt that they were, they were surprised um, and they were blindsided by this, which was a lesson to me as in when our daily conversations we talked about one-to-one -one and we always talked about how we want to pair things 50-50, but they weren't involved in the, in the process um, of, of how we came from here to here. We didn't really think they needed to be, and I know other cities who are working on the same project as well because we've been comparing notes to this whole thing. The city of St. Louis Park is in the exact same spot we are right now with this. Um, is they too didn't we didn't hold any public, you know, we just we didn't think the need was there, so we didn't we didn't do that. Um, so of our fifteen or of our fifty seven properties, only eighteen along the entire time, so these last two years that we've had a green card member, eighteen of those buildings have refused to even look at us. They don't want to open our mail, they don't want to open the packages we send, they don't want to answer the door, the phone, the email. So 18 of them um, have refused, and the remainder we've always been, been working with. So to date, we have 11 who are one-to-one, -one, 35 who are in the process of one-to-one. -one. Some are very close, so there's a few hurdles we're working on. And then that 18 is now down to 11. So I believe we're making good progress. Um, there's, there's some deeper political things going on within our city council that they've kind of put the brakes on it for a minute, brought it back, and so we're, last night there was actually a, a, a first reading to rescind um, the, the ordinance, um, but out of the seven, there's only one vote for that, the rest want to just tweak it a little bit to kind of look at some of the real concerns. Um, but I did want to make note on here that we workshopped this three times with city council, we held two information sessions that we invited all of our multi-units to. Um, we had put plenty of opportunities out there for them to bring concerns forward to us and to try to work with us on it. Five out of the 57 appeared and came. It was, it was just silent. So moral of the story, they just don't want to change. Um, so the update, this is literally as of last night's council meeting. Um, the, this will go back for a workshop on October 10th. We're going to talk about how we're going to have to, we have to find a middle ground and tweak this. The concerns that the managers are saying is the lack of enclosure space, which some of that is a real concern. Others, it's just they're afraid to take that step and they don't want to. Um, they feel their needs are, are, they're meeting the needs of their residents and they don't need the change. Um, we hear a lot of, these people aren't capable of changing, which we think is a very, um, you know, don't go there, you know. Um, cost, we've shown in the buildings that we've worked with, we can save you money. If you don't let us in, we can't help you. So there's a cost. And that also goes down to the enclosure piece as well. Um, a lot of them don't like big government. Um, and then some actually feel that we're holding the multi-units to a higher standard than single family or business, which is interesting because in our city, we have a code that says businesses recycle twice a week. And our single family homes, the basic standard, everybody has a 96 gallon cart. It, granted, it's emptied every other week, but you can have as many carts as you want at no extra cost. You pay for it whether you use recycling or not. Um, and even at the lowest, so that you know, 96 divided by two is just you're, what you're providing our residents curbside is so much greater than what we're giving our, our, our multi-unit residents the opportunity to have. So.
So our workshop, the options, so I need to come up with a middle, a meet in the middle approach. It's either have it go away completely or what, you know, what is realistic. Um, so in working with the City of St. Louis Park, Emily and I have been working pretty closely together with, you know, because like I said, we're both here at the same site level field right now. Um, we're really shooting for that equality piece. You know, just because you choose to live in an apartment building does not allow you to have less access to things. Um, some, of, some of our managers do such a great job of things and, and some of them are just need so much more work. But, you know, bulky waste, when it comes to curbside, we manage our bulky waste on our own and it doesn't count as our, um, you know, within our carts for recycling and, and trash. Um, and the hard part of it is, is we have a 50-50 split on our waste haulers. Some want all that big, the couches, the, the mattresses. Some of them don't want them anywhere near their dumpsters. Keep them out. While the other half of them are saying, nope, it's easier on my driver if you put them in. So there's such an inconsistency there between waste haulers. But that's, it's really tough to hold somebody to a one-to-one -one standard when somebody just put their couch in there. And you just took away that opportunity for the real trash needs that are there. So. Um, so that's the bulky waste issue. We're looking at either doing a one to two option or the 20 gallons per unit. Get some kind of like why I had asked you about, you know, that state law. Is there, can you give us at least something to work with a requirement of minimum? Um, so what we would, these are the, one of the two options that I may, that we'll talk about. This, um, you know, this one gives people a lot more options. This is like the lower of the two. Um, but at least it would hold a building accountable. So if you have 20 units or 150 units, there's some sort of a standard because you can't just put one cart on a building of 200 units and call that past the law um, because it's just not. And then I get phone calls all the time saying, why can't we get more recycling or why can't it come weekly versus every other week? It's just not fair. So. Um, and then with each of those, we would want to require weekly collection. Um, we, when we were starting to research this, we noticed a redu or a, an error in our city codes that we're trying to get fixed as part of this is that our rental code required weekly recycling, but our trash code required um, every other week. And then another thing to keep in mind is the term semi and bi weekly have several different meanings. Um, and so that was not liked by our city council and city staff because it's not a very black and white um, thing. So discoveries that we've just come across, just some little tidbits that it, to me are, are just helpful. You know, that squeaky wheel, man. You get you get five buildings who just don't like something and they get all the attention and the 52 that are working really great with you, it doesn't matter because they're not complaining or, or coming forward. Um, site visits, um, when we did those, we try to get as close to the trash time as possible to, to monitor that waste and recycling to see how much was in there. Um, but some of them come at 6.30 or 6 a.m. on a Monday morning and it was really hard to get in there. So um, we now have things that we can do to help with that with on-site tracking. But um, the miscommunication piece, you know, we all sometimes work within our our norms and forget that not everybody's in our same world and so just being a little bit more um, I don't want to say transparent because we weren't trying to hide anything it's just explaining that better to all parties involved um, there's a huge disconnect between the real needs of on-site and off-site management so if you have a manager on site who knows their people and knows everything about what's happening there um, the person they report to is five cities away or two counties away or three states away and they just don't like the change or don't want to be told to change. They have no connection to what's really happening on their property because they're never there. Um, we had some managers who all of a sudden one week I got, I had been asking for feedback and I hadn't received anything um, for two months while we were going through this. I had said if anyone has any information, if city council is hearing anything, city staff, please let me know. And I didn't hear anything. And then all of a sudden, one day, I get my email and it was like 18, like boom, 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 boom. And some of them were dated like July and I did or just never sent to me or, or forwarded off to me. But I had phone calls from managers, which to me it was, it was so sad because they had said, I didn't want to write this letter, but I was told I had to. 
So they had to show the appearance of we can't make this work when they were they have an amazing program on their building and they were just told they can't take it to the next level. So um, and then to me the biggest thing for success or fail is the management style because we had heard oh I have a hot property um, these people are capable of change we have so many I can't find them for their couch I, my hands are tied. Um, I, I would go to one HUD property or one one struggling building and hear that, and I'd go to the next building who had the exact same um, card stacked against them. But they had an amazing manager who like knew everyone by name, helped them through things, was like a really great resource, cleanest recycling I've ever seen. Um, and then it was like success versus failure. It just didn't work with what they were telling me their complaints or issues were. So. Um, the management style that's at each property is so dire to the success um, of, of this project. So, that's all I have. So, I know it's a lot of information in a very yeah, short period yeah. of time, but I wanted to give you a little snapshot of where we're at right now. So, any questions? How does yeah. the how does the breakdown of or who picks it up? I mean, the haulers have to take recycling, or is that a separate? Uh, well, our city code states that you can't sell recycling without trash or trash without recycling. Um, and um, each property has to have recycling on it. So we did that years ago, back in like 2004, 2006, when we had other interns work for us, where we had gone to make sure. Um, I think we had like three buildings who had no recycling. So everybody's always had it. It's to what level? Like we have a bill, we have a property who has like 157 units. And they have 196 gallon cars that is emptied every other week. <laughs> so you know what I mean. So that's no, but who picks it up? Who literally picks it up? The waste haulers. And they have to do recycling as well as the garbage. Yep. Yep. It's mandatory in our. So it's not the property manager. The onus is on the garbage haulers. Yes. Well, the, yeah. The managers have to make sure everything is in place, um, but then they go through their contracts to make sure. In their service provider, they say what service they need, um, and the providers are scheduled that in. So, um, do they have two trucks then, or what, how do they separate? Yeah, yeah, there's a trash truck and a recycling truck. So they on the same route or the same day, or just doesn't matter. Um, they can determine what their collection trash. days should be based on on what they think they need. Okay. Um, but I mean, we have some buildings who get trash picked up five days a week, and and from one of the things that we know we noted in our site visits is. Apartment buildings have way more trash volume than they use. So some buildings we have, they've got nine eight yard um, containers and each one's only half full and they're emptied like four times a week. So you're paying for so much service um, and you're not even using it all. Yeah. I guess when I think about apartments, I'm not familiar with multi-tenant facilities in specific, but I remember having, you know, we've all lived in those facilities. And the things that you see are a lot of tech, a lot of appliances, um, apparatuses, lamps, but the sort of thing, couches. Yeah. Uh, maybe that's why there's an accommodation for those. Oh, okay. yeah. Okay. End of the month, being, you know, being no. waste. Um, there, are, there are certain organizations that have popped up in Minnesota, especially tech them. Um, but is there a way to incentivize these managers to parse out the tech that they get, especially at the beginning of the month? Whether there's a monetary incentive there, where you put that stream here, as opposed to I don't I don't know how if they how and if they have to actually pay exorbitant amounts of money for these and tech, especially, but also yep. couches and such. Yeah. There's better avenues for those things to go down. You can actually say, hey, that's seventy dollars for this recycling, and you can pick up. You can also add these additional upticks because we're sourcing better avenues for this. Yep. Now we're talking five hundred dollars a month for that. Incentive. Well, we give them, um, we, like you said, in this folder of information, we give them. So at the recycling center that I run, um, we have a vendor in place that does all of our appliances, electronics. And they've extended a special pricing contract or agreement, I guess, for our multi-units. So it would be less if they were to just go there on their own. So there's there's like a price deal. They'll take their mattresses for this amount. They'll take their um, appliances, electronics, at special rates versus if you needed to walk in with them. So we've given them resources, and then we've given them, like, we have some waste haulers who will just do a special day of just bulky item pickups. And so 
Um, and we're also trying to promote reuse and try to get some of those containers in there when it's um, feasible. Um, so, I mean, we have many options and many tools that we can give them. Um, it's whether they want to take it or not and, and what they want to do with it. So we have an abundance of programming and um, signage and pamphlets and education and resources that we have just this tool of ask me for it and I'd love to give it to you. Um, a lot of them just don't want to deal with it. Yeah, anything above that one minute. Yep. Yeah, they just they want you know when we did along this route we did a special we held we had a big luncheon um, at a restaurant and we invited all the managers out to come and what is tell me what is where do I go in the pecking order of your daily stuff like <laughs> is, do you care at all you just want it out of there are you more dealing with um, terrible tenants or um, damages or show me what is the day in the life of of you. Um, and that was interesting to see where we ranked on there, um, but actually we were pretty high because we're that annoyance. It's, it's, I don't want to say that we are an annoyance, but if you think about it, if, and if I could connect the dots, and, and it's so way out of my world of what I want to do, but um, good manager, less turnover, less bulky items, a, a more um, approach of they want to be helpful. For the people who live there, not so great manager, um, high turnover, constant turnover, um, way more needs for oh, that. turnover of, of, of people uh, who live in there. Oh. People who live in there, yeah. So, more, yeah. More so like we have one property went an entire year without one move in or move out, and then the year after that mm -hmm. they only had three, and it was basically because the the families within them bettered themselves and went into a single family home, um, and so I mean so over two years. Two year ter or two year time period, you're looking at um, three move outs. I think that's really successful, and it says a lot about the manager, the program, everything that they have there. Um, so it, it's interesting to look at this from a different perspective than a lot of people are to connect those dots and see how it affects things. So yeah. You know, if if you were to determine having looked at these multifamily, uh, for instance, this, uh, hall or pickup style dealing with the, the bulkies. If you were determined, you know, these bulky items really should be separate. <coughs> as as hauler licenses came up for renewal, I mean, cities have the authority to say, as a condition of license, your bulkies need not to be tossed into the garbage because that's going to prevent, you know, create spillover and so forth. I mean. That would be theoretically possible, correct? Yeah. It, it, gets, it gets hard because. Um, is that too prescriptive or? No, but what happens is we've had things in there before about. Um, they're always they want to have a our, our city attorney always wants to have a checks and a balance system in place. So if you have something written in city um, licensing but not in city code, oh. they like to have them. Handedly, so they can the attack you. So there's, the, yep, so there's repercussions to say you're not doing this, you're also violating city code, rather than to say we're going to pull your license. Uh -huh. The code should lead, lead to the license. Of the license. Yeah. Yeah. So there's that, that whole thing that, that goes on. So, Got it. And, you know, and I've, it's not beneath me to, like with tonnage reports, I had one way taller this was years back who just was not giving me tonnage reports because I have to report to the county, written on report to the state. And so um, I finally just started the process to revoke their license. And it came actually to the tape of the city council meeting and they finally provided the stuff. And um, from now on they're like monthly clockwork. But sometimes I don't think that you really have any you no know, intentions of following through with something. So when you give them that little yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, <laughs> That's the approach I like uh, to take. But yeah, I should say on the on the Green Step City's website, we do have the sort of ordinance model ordinance, uh, and then we do have the model sort of hauler license template stuff. So so we have sort of harmonized them. This work that the Post Associates did. So it, it is there. It's there. But every city is different, and you've had years and decades of tweaking and. Are they totally harmonious? Because you didn't say anything. Um, 
where does the garbage go? And do you have any sort of MRFs or people sorting to or pulling anything, or is it strictly landfill? Where does it go? So in Anoka County, most of our waste goes to Great Rivers Energy, which is a waste to energy plant. Very do little in, in landfill. Do they do any uh, MRFing or separating of the recycled waste? Um, well, at, the, at Great Rivers Energy, they do pull out the, they extract the metals yeah. um, out of it. Um, the rest is burnt for energy. Um, all of our um, recycled, I mean, you've got the waste management MRF and the um, Republic MRF. Um, so everything that goes through their recycling line, at least, gets a, kind of a once over. Um, but as far as trash goes, that all goes to Great Rivers Energy, and then only parts of that are extracted. Do you have any idea of the numbers of that I mean, as far as your rec? I mean, just to tell people how much is actually, I mean, you must pull. Citywide, or what do you mean? No, I mean, just a comparison. You're getting so much for recycling, but you're also, the MRFs are getting so much. You know, well, I, I know that Great Rivers Energy um, is an egg. Ooh. And I don't want to give, I don't want to quote misinformation. Right. I don't remember right. right off the top of my head which percentages are which. Fine. I just I was curious. Okay. Well, thank you, Colleen. Uh, and so, thank you all for today. Just a uh, last check. Any questions on the? Um, no questions on the webinar. Webinar. Okay. Thank you, webinar people, for checking in. This was, you know, sometimes we have technology problems. So thank you mm -hmm. for. Uh, this worked uh, wonderfully. Um, and we're on time. Any final uh, questions um, or comments? Here. Well, wonderful. Thank you. Thank you all for being here. We have um, uh, uh, same time, same place. First Wednesday next month, we're going to look at the energy climate uh, assistance that the Great Plains Institute, uh, very specifically, has been doing uh, in the metro and actually throughout, uh, throughout Minnesota. So we'll learn more about. Um, uh, those plans, which are often being worked into comp plans, certainly in the metro area for cities, but um, in greater Minnesota, cities are not required to have a comp plan at all, actually. But we do know that and are working with some green sub cities that are working uh, energy and climate goals into uh, comp plans. So that'll be next month. Um, and as far as, again, reaching, uh, reaching people, um, Angie is the best practice advisor for Best Practice 25. You can reach her there. And then Kayla, you can reach under Best Practice 22 Solid Waste, uh, reach her through Tim as the Best Practice Advisor, but contact Tim and you can get to Kayla. So, all right. So thank you all. Have a good, uh, have a good day.